you know, every parsha in the Torah is deep and it's intriguing and it's uh, uh, complex. It, it, this is puzzling. This is a very puzzling parsha. We have to understand that, uh, what, 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 what's really going on here. Vayeshev Yaakov be'eretz mevurev be'eretz kanan. So Yaakov dwells in the land of his father. Ela told us Yaakov, Yosef ben Shvaz, Reishonah Yeroah, Zecha Batzon. Yosef was 17 years old. Vunar is b'nei Vila, is b'nei Zilpa, and Eshe Aviv. He hung out with the sons of Bila and Zilpa. Vayave Yosef is the Basam Ra'el Aviyam. Yosef brought a bad report about his brothers. Now, um, the first thing we have to understand is where it says Vayeshev Yaakov. So Rashi brings down over here a certain criticism for Yaakov. Bikesh Yaakov Leshev Bishalva, the Medrash says. Vaod Nidrash Bo. Rashi brings down other ideas, and then he says like this Vayeshev Bikesh Yaakov Leshev Bishalva. Yaakov, after all of his travails, and Rachel died, and Shechem, and everything he's been through, he wants to dwell in tranquility. Kofatz all of Rogzel Shal Yosef. So he gets the aggravation of the whole situation with Yosef. Tzadikim mevakshiv leishev v'shalva tzadikim want to dwell in tranquility. Omer HaKodesh Boruchu, lo dayan lo tzadikim ha'shem mesukan al-olam abad, not enough what they have waiting in the world to come. Ela she mevakshiv leishev v'shalva v'olam azad, they want to dwell in tranquility in this world. Can't be. You're going to, you know, tranquility is for the world to come. Oh. So the plain meaning is exactly what it sounds like. The plain meaning is, listen, you're, you're, you know, you're not going to get both worlds. You know, the, 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 a Russia who does a mitzvah gets paid in this world. A tzaddik does a mitzvah, you don't get paid in this world. You may get the benefits of a mitzvah in this world, but you're going to have, you don't, sometimes people have a goal. The goal of life is to be tranquil. The goal of life is to chill. Right? And first of all, life, life experience, you don't chill in life. There's never a stage when, you're, when, you're, when you retire from dealing with life. If you're not dealing with life, that means you're horizontal. Right? You're not dealing with life. There's no such thing as not dealing with life. And people think, well, now we're raising the kids, the kids are young. Boy, it's exhausting when the kids are young. Ask anybody, you have a two-year-old child in the house. A two-year-old child is physically exhausted. They call it the terrible twos. You chase the two-year-old around the house everywhere you go. If you don't see him, he's doing the wrong thing. The minute you let him out of your sight, a two-year-old is out of your sight, you could bet that he's either got his hands in the toilet or he's playing with the garbage or he's pulling up the pipe somewhere. He's doing the wrong thing. That's why they call it the terrible twos. He's, he could move, but he has no brains. Right? So he's always, and, and they have a sense, though, to do the wrong thing. And if you don't hear him, if, you better hear noise coming from him. If you don't hear him, you know, if you're, if one second, they, where, where is he? Where's the baby? You know, two year old, uh, there he is. Uh, just head straight for any water source in the house because that's where he is. He's with the pipe. He turns something on. He jams something up. Okay. Then you're raising a whole bunch of little kids. It's exhausting. And you can't sleep. And you, uh, you get up in the middle of the night. And you're changing diapers and running to the doctor. Okay. And then finally, the youngest one's about seven years old. Eight years old. He's got a little intelligence. You're thinking, oh, okay. Ho, ho. They became teenagers. <laughs> you think it's hard when they're little. There's a Yiddish expression. I don't know Yiddish well. There's a nasty expression that's worse than Yiddish. When they're little, they step on your toes. When they're bigger, they step on your heart. Right? Yeah, and in Yiddish, it's really like one of those d -d -d doing. Right? And so, so you know, it, it, they're teenagers. Then you marry him off. And you think, okay, he's on his own. Yeah, but he's on his own. Something needs a little extra money. First of all, you got to marry him off. You got to deal with in laws. You got to marry him off. Then you got a daughter in law who might not be listed. Baruch Hashem, we've been blessed. But people have aggravation from their son in law, their daughter in law. The, the, what do you call it? You know, it, 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 it never ends. And then you have grandchildren. And then it, it, it never ends. It never ends. So the tzaddik wants, you want a tranquility? You're getting your tranquility in the world to come. You don't deserve it. You don't get it in this world, number one. Number two, I heard from Rabbi Zev Lef, Shlita, he said, the, 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 the criticism of Yaakov isn't the fact that he wants a tranquility. Tranquility we all want. We all like to be a little bit, you know, ah, Shabbos, ah, you know, a, little, a little tranquility. Tranquility is okay. You can look for tranquility. A, don't make it a prerequisite. Some people say, I can't learn now because, because I don't have a good seat, I don't have a good chavrus, I don't have, and, and I got money pressure. If you're waiting for tranquility before you do something productive with your life, then forget about it. If you have tranquility, that's great. But if you don't have the tranquility, don't make it a prerequisite, number one. Number two, he's not criticized for the desire for the tranquility. He's criticized for the vayeshev. Vayeshev means, I'm that, this is my level, this is where I'm at. There's no such thing. That, there's no such thing. You always have to grow. 
you grow. There's no such thing. What do you mean? I'm retired. I'm retired from spiritual growth. No such thing. You can retire from work, and you can retire from playing golf. You can't retire from spiritual golf. That doesn't happen. And therefore, Yaakov Avino, the criticism, most people don't see it that way. The plain meaning here is the criticism of the pursuit of the tranquility. Rav says that Vayeshev is also a problem. Vayeshev means you're sitting. I used to drive, you know, I was talking about teenagers, you know, watch, watch teenagers sit, sitting in a room. I see my kids just sitting. They're sitting on the couch. They're just sitting. I said to the kid, listen, guys, do something. You know, talk lush and horror. Just do be active, you know, <laughs> just sit. You know, they're just sitting, you know, they, 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 they can drive you nuts, right? So ya- here, Yaakov, it's the sitting that's being criticized. Okay, now, Yaakov has a son. And Yosef brings a bad report to his father. Now, I want to give you an overview from the very beginning, a fascinating, fascinating overview of this whole parsha. Watch what happens. Yosef sees his brothers doing things, and at a deeper level, did Rabbi Madelon talk about the, the dispute between them, what their status was? Are they B'nai Noach? In other words, before the Torah was given, what was the status of the Avos? Are they considered Jews, just they're Jews that have not received the Torah yet? Or since the Torah wasn't given, they are considered B'nai Noach. And that has a certain, uh, uh, what do you call it, that, that has certain ramifications in halacha. Yosef understood the brothers to be uh, 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 one side or the other, either Jews or B'nai Noach. They understood themselves to be something else. He misinterpreted their actions, and he brings a negative report to the father. Okay, so number one, the first mistake is Yosef misinterpreting the actions. Number two, the brothers make a mistake in thinking that Yosef is just your common snitcher. Whereas really what he wants to do is he wants to help them improve. Yaakov makes a mistake in, in, in favoring Yosef. Yosef makes a mistake in telling the brothers his dreams. Hey, guys, I had a great dream. You're all bowing down to me. Right? It's a wonderful dream, considering they can't stand him as, as it is. Right? The brothers understand that his dream made a mistake in thinking his dreams are a delusion of grandeur as opposed to some sort of prophecy. Yaakov makes a mistake of then sending Yosef off to see how the brothers are doing. So they sell it, and then he ends up getting sold. So as Matisyahu Solomon, the, the Mashiach of Lakewood, he says, you have over here what looks like a comedy of errors. Mistake, 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 mistake. Yet what comes out? HaKadosh Baruch Hu's plan eventually is achieved. That means with all the mistakes, who's running the show here? HaKadosh Baruch Hu is still bringing about the result. After each mistake, what's it called on a GPS when you when the GPS makes a mistake so it gets reset? What's it called? Reroute, right? So Kodesh Baruch runs the world. He's going to bring about the result. Yet there's going to be a rerouting every time. How could he be? How could he bring about his result if a mistake was made? Okay, so he reroutes it. But another mistake, so he reroutes it again. But one way or another, Kodesh Baruch is going to bring about the desired result. That's the amazing part of the parsha. Mistake, 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 mistake. I once read there's a guy lost an election, lost an election, lost, 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 and eventually became. And then he won his first election was become president of the United States. Who was it? Abraham Lincoln. It lost, 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 and becomes president of Israel. Lost, 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 and lost, which is Shimon Peres, right? But Abraham Lincoln lost, 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 and eventually won. Right? He becomes president of the United States. Right? So yeah, I just went, okay, mistake, 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 mistake. Ah, but of course, Rojo's plan comes out. That is the underlying theme of the Parsha over here. Okay? So you have Yosef who brings a negative report. He's 17 years old. He's an orphan. And he's kind of lost in between. He doesn't have his brothers. He hangs around with the children of Bila who actually raised him. And then, in Pasuk Gimel, the Yisrael Ahav es Yosef mikol banov ki ben zekunim Yisrael loved Yosef from all of his sons because he was the son of his old age. The also Loksonas Pasu, he made him this cloak of many colors. Now, first of all, you have another problem here. A Ben Zikunim means the son of your old age. They were all born in Yaakov's old age. He got married when he was 84, and they were born within the next seven years. So Yosef makes the son of his old age. Number one. Number two, he had another son, he had Binyamin, who was the youngest. He was really the baby. So, uh, and that's one of the things that's bothering the brothers. If Yaakov is favoring Yosef, He's favoring him because he's the baby, but there's another baby, so why is he favoring Yosef? So it must be that he's favoring Yosef because he's a snitcher. Right? So again, it, it, it just breeds this, and snitchers are never popular. Even, even the, what do you call it, I just heard, by the way, there's a, did I tell you about this Heksher? Somebody told me there's a certain company that produces chickens, and they have Arabs who put the salt on the chickens. 
So I said to the guy, how could he have Arab salting the chickens? I mean, they can't be trusted on the guy. He says, no, 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 because each Arab is paid to snitch on the other Arab if he's not doing the job right. That, to me, is more reliable than a guy with a beard and pay us than anything else. You pay him to, to snitch on his buddy, boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, you'll know, you're going to get the right information there. Right? For 20 bucks, for 20 shekels, they sell the grandmother. Right? So, for, so, so to, sh to salt the chicken, you know, no problem. To turn in the other guy, especially if he's going to make money on it, oh, that's, that's more reliable than anything. So, so they, they, yeah, they're assuming Yosef's a snitcher. And anyway, why does Yaakov favor him? There's a baby brother over there. And the truth of the matter is that Yosef was born immediately, and he favored Yosef for about seven years, so <coughs> Binyamin was born, Binyamin was seven years younger. The other brothers are boom, 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 and then there's a Yosef. So what does Yaakov do? Yaakov makes him a cloak of many colors, in case it wasn't bad enough. In case it wasn't bad enough, he gives him this really beautiful, really beautiful, what he call, and the brothers are just going berserk over here. It's eating them alive. Now, take a look at the very important Rashi here. Rashi says, it's on, it's on page, uh, page 200. Rashi says he makes him a ksones pasi. Take a look at, take a look at, at, at Rashi. It's the second line from the top. Pasim, second line from the top of page 200, right column. Pasim, loshon clay melas. Kimo karpas vitcheles. Ukimo knosa pasim damlam It's a type of material. Now, umem al vogmem al answer umedrish agoda. Pay attention carefully, gentlemen. There's a medrash I got. A medrash says like this: Why is it called a ksones pasim? Al shem tsarosov because of the troubles that he's going to have. Shenim kar potifar. The pay in pasim stands for potifar. Vila socharim, and he's going to be sold to the merchants. That's a samach. Vila yishme elin. That's the yud. It's going to be sold to the yishme elin. Vila midyanim in the midianites. So the word pasim. The Ksones Pasim, the cloak of many colors, stands for Potiphar, Yishma'elim, Socharim, and Midyanim. Those are the, the aggravation he's going to have. Okay. I mean, you know, okay, that's what it stands for. My reaction as well, okay, if you say so. What, what's the Torah trying to tell you with that? What's the Medrash trying to communicate with that? Why, why, why do I care what it stands for? How quaint it stands for that? What, 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 what's the lesson for me? What, what's the Medrash trying to tell us with that? So, you know, in life, one of the commentaries points out like this. You're jealous of somebody, right? You're jealous. When we're jealous of people, we're often jealous in a very isolated manner. I find out somebody just won the lottery. I'm jealous. Do you know what? Yeah, you're jealous? You mean you want that one item out of his life. Do you want the rest of his life also? Do you know who his mother-in-law is? Oh, oh, I didn't know. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. You, will you, you'll take, if you get the lottery, you get the mother-in-law too. You know, in other words, you want to be him? Are you sure you want to be him? Yeah, you, do you know who his wife is? Do you know who his kids are? Do you know, do you know what kind of aggravation he has from his boss? Do you know what kind of a physical pain he has? No, no, we, we only look at one thing. We're very, very short-sighted. We look at one thing. That, that I want. Yeah, but you don't that. You get the whole package or none of it. You sure you want his whole package? You sure you want that whole package? Imagine at the time that he was given the Xonus, the cloak, the brother, just oh so jealous. And then you show them, oh, by the way, you know what he's going to go through? He's going to go through Potiphar. He's going to be in jail for 10 years, 12 years. He's going to get whipped, beaten, almost killed, sold by the Ishvailim. He's going to go to these merchants. You want that whole package? Are you sure you want it? No, 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 I'll pass if you knew in advance what was, what was included in the package, then you wouldn't be jealous of the package. A lot of people, my friend's in medical school, makes a good parnasa. He's a doctor. Everybody respects him. Okay, you want what he has? Yeah. You sure? You want to go through medical school and not sleep for about six years? No, no, no. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Right? You could have it. You have what he has, but you got to go through six years of dep sleep deprivation. No, no, forget it. Forget it. I'm out. Sure, now look at the whole package. I told you about the diamond, right? This lady sitting on the plane. She's a friend of hers. She's sitting on the plane next to a passenger on the plane. This lady's got a big, beautiful diamond. Oh, gorgeous diamond. She looks at her, she goes, wow, that's a really nice diamond. She says, yes, it is a nice diamond. I mean, she said, no, it's a seriously nice diamond. She says, yes, it's a beautiful diamond. She says, wow, I really like that diamond. She says, yes, it's the famous Plotnik diamond. But it comes with a curse. She says, really? What's the curse? She goes, Mr. Plotnik. <laughs> 
Okay. Say, you know, yeah, sure, the diamond, the diamond looks great. Yeah, you want to live with the guy? Right? You, know, you, you want to, yeah, yeah, he comes with the diamond, yeah, I'll trade it. I don't want the diamond, I don't want the husband, I don't want the whole package. And therefore, the Torah is teaching you, before you adjust, I heard about a story here in Israel. Here in Israel, these two brothers were fighting over an inheritance. <coughs> there was a Mercedes on the line. Yeah, yeah, that gets a pshh, all right, yeah. I always told the guys, listen, for my birthday, if you buy me a car, which is the only thing I want, there's only one car, a Mercedes. So if you guys want to pitch in and buy me a Mercedes, I'm good, right? It doesn't matter, color, I'm not picky, right? But a Mercedes. So these two brothers are fighting. The father died, left a Mercedes, a brand new Mercedes. The brothers were fighting over They went to court. The judge ruled it, gave it to one of the brothers. <laughs> and that gets in the Mercedes, drove about a 200 yards to the tree and died instantly. Now you jealous? Now you want the Mercedes? Right? Now you want the Mercedes? You understand? <laughs> if you knew in advance where it was going to go to, would you want it? That's what the Torah is telling you. Before you're jealous of somebody, before you're jealous of somebody, just think about the entire package. Sometimes you see people in life who are successful. Are you sure you want what they got? Are you sure, so sure, you get the entire... Michael Jordan once said, people would like to be Michael Jordan for a day. I would like to be Michael Jordan for a day. He said, well, you're not Michael Jordan for a day. It's not for a day. It's never being able to leave the house, and it's never being able to go anywhere without, without a, 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 what do you call it, without in, a, 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 in, incognito. It's never, ever, ever, okay, I have trouble feeling bad for him, right? I do have trouble feeling bad for Michael Jordan. You know, it's not like, I, it's not like my heart bleeds for him, but I understand where he's coming from. I understand where he's coming from. You're, you know, listen, you want it, you get the whole package. It's not, it's not part, you can't have part of it. That's what the Torah is teaching. Okay, now. The brothers, to their credit, it says like this. Vayiru echav ki oso ahava. Now pay attention carefully because we're going to see a little bit of a, little bit of a conflict here. Vayiru echav ki oso ahava via mikol echav. The brothers saw that the father loved him more than all, more than all the brothers. Vayisnu uoso. They hated him. Velo yachlu dabra l'shalom. They couldn't speak to him amicably. So they didn't talk to him. They hated him. They didn't talk to him. Says Rashi. When we, hear their, we hear their criticism. The brothers are criticized for hating him, but we hear the praise along with the criticism. What's the praise? The praise is that they weren't two-faced. I don't like you, and I'm going to make sure you know I don't like you. I'm not going to be, I don't like you, yet I'm going to pretend that I do. Then you're being two-faced. I don't know what's really going on. I mean, Yosef sat at the breakfast table and said good morning to 11 brothers. Nobody said good morning back. At least I know where we're holding here. At least I know where we're holding. Right? Hi, fellas. And they're like, hi, how are you? Yeah, this is Hollywood. It's not politics. The brothers are honest. Right? We don't like you. We have a claim against you. And, and their claim is twofold. And both of this is, this is, you could be wrong. This shows in life. You could be wrong. And you could prove that you're right in every different way. They said, listen, there's a reason why we can't talk to him. We have a mitzvah to hate him. It's a mitzvah. Oh, when it's a mitzvah, you got to be careful. We have a mitzvah today. What's the mitzvah? Mimanovshach. Mimanovshach means any way you turn over here, Yosef's wrong. If he's bringing a false report, then we certainly have to hate him. Then we certainly have to hate him. When you bring a false, false report to the daddy for about our behavior, then we certainly should hate you. Then you're just a bala shenhar. You're a mozi shemra. You're doing everything wrong. And if it's true, so why are you going to daddy? When you see a Jew doing something wrong, what are you supposed to do? Go up to the Jew and rebuke him. Go up to the Jew and put him in the right path. Why are you, why are you bypassing us? So even in the best scenario, we if we've done something wrong and you notice we're doing something wrong, why don't you come to talk to us? Why are you going to this? Why are you skipping over us? Either way, we have a right to hate you. But what's the underlying reason? What's the underlying reason? <coughs> They're jealous. They're jealous. You know, the, the, well, the underlying reason at the end of the day, bottom line, and you could justify it from today till tomorrow. Bottom line is they're jealous. Now watch this. Take a look in that Pusik Dalit again, top line. I, I picked out, uh, I had a question on this and I asked a friend of mine who gave me a very good answer. Take a look at Pusik Dalit. His brothers saw that the father loved him more than all the brothers. Also they hated him. Now, I got a question. Is there any, any problem with that Pusik? Something not problem, something a little bit odd with that puzzle, a little bit peculiar in Puzzling Dalit. Something peculiar, something is bothering me. As I read the puzzle, I've seen this puzzle many times, and something just, just jumped off the page at me. It says, his bro- the brother saw, Vayiru Echav, his brother saw, Ki oso ahav avihem, that the father loved him, Mikol Echav, from all of his brothers. What should it have said? 
The brothers saw the father loved him more than all of them. All of them. Why does it repeat Echav a second time? The brothers saw that he loved, the father loved him more than the brothers. Now, first it talks about, it, it should say, the brothers saw that the father loved him more than them. Why does it say the brothers again? Mikol Echav. It should say he loved the father more than them. So I asked a friend of mine, he said to me, look, you got 11 brothers here all together, 12 brothers. One is bound to be the most beloved. Okay, one is bound to be the most beloved. So I say, you know what? Yes, is the most beloved of all of us. He's the one I love the most. Okay, listen, it's got to be somebody. It's got to be somebody. If it wouldn't be him, so it would be Mr. Fo- it's got to be somebody. So it happens to be him. Okay, but so everybody, you can't, you know, if it wasn't him, it could just easily be you, or it could be you, it could be you. Okay, it happens to be him. So if he loves one more than any of the others, okay, that happens. All right, happens to be Yosef. This is good fortune. But if you look, read the Pesach, it says, he loved him more than all the brothers. That means they understand he loved Yosef more than a whole bunch of them put together. Mikol Echov. The brothers, see, he loves him more than the whole bunch of us put together. That's already out of the ordinary. You don't love one kid more than all the other kids put together. You like one kid, he happens to be your favorite. But not that one kid, more than all the others. But they see about something much deeper. They, they, this, they've been through this once. Avram Avinu had two sons. Yitzhak's the chosen son. Yishmael is a write-off. Yaakov has two sons. Yitzhak has two sons. Yaakov is the chosen son. Esav is the write-off. And they're already anticipating, especially since Rashi says, Yaakov taught Yosef the Torah that he learned. And now he loves him more than everybody else. What are they anticipating over here? It's going to be him and the rest of us are going to be a write-off. We're going to go the way of Yishmael. We're going to go the way of Lot. And we're going to go the way of, uh, of Esav. We're going to be a write-off over here. There's a tremendous amount of resentment. And then Yosef makes another mistake. Vayomer Aleyem. Vayachalom Yosef Chalom. Yosef has a dream. Vayageid Lechav. Yosef no, so he hasn't even told them the dream. Yosef has a dream and he tells the brothers. What does he tell them? Hey guys, I had a dream. They hate him even more. Right? I also am annoyed when people want to tell me their dreams, right? Hey Daddy, you want to hear my dream? No. No, I, I, I really don't. I really don't. Right? And my wife always says, Oh, I had the weirdest dream. Yes, and you're gonna keep it to yourself. You know, I really don't want to hear about it, you know. Yeah. Now my dream is a significant dream. You know, no, I don't I don't want to hear about your dream. I'm not interested in your dream. What was it my fault that you're weird? You know, I don't want to hear your dream. So Yosef first goes, Hey, I had a dream. <laughs> now why? Why? I mean, why should they resent the fact that he's telling them about the dream before he even tells them what the dream is? Why did they resent why does that trigger resentment? Why should that trigger resentment? Before we get the prophecy, before, okay, there's probably Ruchi. They understand if Yosef has a dream, it's not just a dream like we had because we had too much pizza at night, so he dreamt being chased by a bunch of Italians, right? And we, he understands that it's not, that it's not just a, a, what do you call it? What, why, why should they? He hasn't even told them the dream. Hey, Daniel, I had a dream. Why, why? Why are they? Why should, the question was, what good is the dream of Russia? Good, good, very. Okay, that's, that's, you're getting very deep. Let's keep it on a human, let's take it on a human level for a second. It's changing course. First of all, you see we're not talking to you. What are you coming chasing after us for, number one? Number two, a dream is generally something you share with somebody very intimate. These are my private thoughts. I'll share it with you. Hey, can't you take the hint? None of us are talking to you. Why are you pretending that we're on such good terms for? So the very fact that he's even willing to tell a dream, they're already upset about that. Then look with it. Then the dream itself. Vayomer Aleyhem. Shimunach. Allah Listen to this dream I had. Yeah. All right, everybody's paying it, every kind of looking at him. You know, they're kind of looking at a cross as it is. We're, we're binding sheaves. My sheaves stood up straight. And your sheaves bowed down to my sheaves. And everybody's looking at him. Nobody's smiling. And nobody's smiling. Yeah. Here's the dream he comes to share with the brothers who are already upset with him. My guys, great dream. Your sheaves are all bowing down to my sheaves. Right? The brothers say, You're going to rule over us? You're going to reign over us? They added it to the hatred, fuel to the fire. 
Vayachah, he doesn't get it. He just doesn't get it. I mean, Yosef's a smart man. He just seems not to get it. He tells another. Another dream, guys. The sun and the moon. The sun and the moon and the eleven stars are bowing down to me. Now there's not even a symbolism. It's not even my sheaves. It's me. And the sun and moon are bowing down. I remember as a kid thinking to myself, how does the sun bow? The sun doesn't have knees. It's a ball. How does a ball bow? That's a, that's a, that's a, you know, I, <laughs> not quite sure, you know, with the little face, you know, exactly how that works. A technical question, right? But they're all bowing down to me. Okay, now watch, watch. Pay attention very carefully, gentlemen. Pay attention very carefully. Sun, the moon, 11 stars. By Yisapir Alovi Velechov, he tells it over to his father and his brothers. By Yigar Bo Aviv, his father growls at him. By Yomrlo Machalom Azeshach, what kind of dream are you having? Is your mother going to come to bow down to you? His brothers were jealous. His father kept it on file. Do you notice the difference in their reaction by the second dream and the first dream? What's the difference in their reaction? How do they react after the second dream? Look carefully at the psukim. His brothers are jealous. What does it say after he tells them the first dream? No? What does it say? Yona, do me a favor. Open the door so it gets to me. What does it say after the first dream? Look carefully. Look carefully at the plukim. After the first dream, he told them the first dream, it says, they hated him, and they added hatred. After the second dream, what does it say? They says they were jealous of him. What happened to the hatred? The hatred doesn't, cons- it doesn't add to the hatred. It says the je- they were jealous. It says openly, by Kanumbachov, they're jealous. What's the difference between the first dream and the second dream? The answer is, in the first dream, it's me and you were out in the field, and your sheaves are bowing to my sheaves. In the second dream, he's got the sun and the moon and 11 stars. Well, who are the sun and moon represent? Father and mother. mother. Okay, so Yaakov tries to make light of it by saying, yeah, but your mother's dead, kid. So the one, the moon, that represents your mother, you know the dream is nonsense, the whole thing is nonsense. But Yaakov also knows that every dream has some nonsense in it but it's just to diffuse the tension. And in the meantime, Aviv Shamar Zodar, Yaakov puts it on file because he knows there's some things to it. Why did Yaakov know there's something to it, and why were the brothers only jealous after a second dream? You see, it's like this. Where do you dream? Where do dreams come from? There's a Gemara that talks, the Gemara talks all about dreams. Where do dreams come from? Dreams are a result of what you think about, what you experience, and what you eat. So if a person is experiencing something, or you're thinking about something, you're thinking about your finals. Everybody has, think about finals. Most people have a, like a Yom Kippur night dream where they're going to a faucet. You know, there's a faucet in the house or something. You're, Yom Kippur, you're so conscious not to drink or eat. You know, you have this dream that you're going to the refrigerator or something. You know, you dream you're so nervous about it because you're constantly consumed by it. You might have eaten something spicy, you ate something sweet, you had something, something that you ate affects your dreams. Your experiences in life, like I could dream tonight that you're being chased by this giant fly. Right? Now, all these things, all these things, any negative experiences in life, it's a friendly homish fly. All, all, your friendly exper- all your experiences could affect your dream. So you'll say a couple of lawyers and say, listen, I had a dream, guys, you're all bowing down to me. Oh, you no good. Now, that's what you're walking around thinking about all day, about your brothers bowing down to you. That's what you're walking around daydreaming about, obviously, if that's the dream you had at night. So you got these delusions of grandeur of ruling over us, and you had a dream that our sheaves, okay, so something about sheaves, but if that's what you're thinking about, so they hate them. You're trying, you want to rule over it. Uh-oh, then he has another dream. And in the second dream, there's a representation of the father and the mother. No one, you might want your brothers to bow down to you. Many people do. No one dreams about their father and mother bowing down to them. If there's a symbolism of the father and mother bowing down to them, then the brothers here, there's some truth to this. This can't be something that he was thinking about. There must be some sort of prophetic vision in this dream. We can't hate him for that, but we're certainly jealous. And therefore, the brothers at this point, the Torah says, they're jealous, not the, not the hatred. You understand the difference? Because there's obviously something to the dream. There's obviously something to the dream. We had another Pasuk in the Torah that says, Vatikane Rochel Ba'achosa. Rochel was jealous of her sister. Okay? We understand the jealousy at their level. All of these things have to be understood at the level of the Avos. 
and we understand that the jealousy at some level is, I'm jealous that I wasn't, now, at some point, deep down inside, deep, 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 deep down inside, it's jealousy. We're human beings. They're jealous at the spiritual level he's attained that he is the one who's going to be there. But there's a human element here. That's what we have to learn from it. Whatever is going, a human being is capable of being jealous to the point that you'll sell your brother. They're bothered. It's gnawing away at them, and often you don't even admit it to yourself. By the way, you know how the easiest way to get over jealousy? What's the easiest way to get over jealousy? What's that? That's right. That's right. Just go up to the person, whatever, the guy makes a lot of money, you go over there, I want to tell you I'm really jealous of you. You'll feel better that you got it out. The jealousy wrinkles and eats up inside. It eats people up inside. People have been jealous of me because I'm very good looking. You know, it's only when they come over and say it to me, I see they feel much better. Right? So, uh, why is that funny, Daniel? The, uh, the uh, what do you call it, my hairstyle especially. So the, 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 when you own up to it, when you own up to it, then you get it out of your system. I remember there was a guy in the neighborhood I was jealous of. Something happened, he succeeded. So I said to him, by the way, I'm jealous of you. He said to me, no, you're not. He couldn't imagine me doing it. I said, no, no, I really am. I really am. I said, no, why would you be jealous of that? Right? And people are jealous. The guy drives up with a new car, you're jealous. And it eats you up. I walk up and I say, by the way, I'm jealous of your new car. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Do you know how much this costs me in gasoline? I don't care. I'm jealous. And once I say it, then you, it kind of... Okay, now what are you doing? Now, and he, 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 when you see, what else happens is when I'm jealous of you, you also probably, I'm always worried you, you suspect that I'm jealous of you. You even sense that I'm suffering. So I got to get it said. Once I get it said, it's out in the open, you start to feel better. That's a rule. So the brothers are jealous. They're jealous of you. It says openly in the Torah. Vaikano Bech is a Pasuk in the Torah. Vatikane Rechel Bechosa is a Pasuk in the Torah. Okay, now. Vayelcho Echav Lircho Liros Eson Aviyam Bishchem. The brothers go off to a place called Shechem. Shechem is a place where there's always a lot of trouble. Shechem is where Dino is violated. Shechem is where Yosef is going to get sold. Shechem is where the Davidic dynasty gets divided up. Shechem represents rebellion. Shechem represents the refusal to accept authority. When Shechem violates Dina, other than the blatant act of what he's doing, there's a message over there. We don't accept your authority. Yosef's brothers sell him. We don't accept your authority. The Davidic dynasty later on in history is divided. The rebellion begins in Shechem. We don't accept Rechavim, the son of Shlomo. The people rebel in Shechem. We don't accept your authority. It's always a place that represents the rebellion. Shechem is always a place where there's trouble. So now it says like this. So now we come to the uh, uh, we, we come to a very very important uh, uh, fundamental in the Torah. Let me send you off to your brothers. Yosef says, I'm ready to go, even though he knows that this might not end well. He knows the brothers resent him. His father wants him to go. And according to the commentaries, he feels that he's becoming what's called a shleach mitzvah. A shleach mitzvah, the Gemara says, when you're an agent to do a mitzvah, you can't, no harm could befall you. And we'll see that Yosef escapes the harm in the end. He doesn't get killed. Go see how your brothers are doing in the, in the cattle. So he sends them off. Pay attention carefully. He's, a man finds him, and Yosef is wandering because he, he can't find the right place. What are you looking for? Who is this Ish? Who was this Ish that showed up over there? So Gavriel, the angel Gavriel Rashi says, who's this man who happened to, he's, Yosef's wandering around looking for his brothers, and hey, what are you looking for? I'm looking for him, oh, they went that way. How providential that the man should show up. So the, uh, the, uh, um, the Ramban says over here, the Ramban says over here, first of all, there's a concept that the Ramban uses an expression, um, Effort is futile, the decree is going to come to fruition one way or another. Your effort in life is, going to, is not going to bring the results. The results are going to be whatever God's decree is. Yosef is going to end up by the brothers, and he's going to have to become the king. And even if he's wandering around and he's going lost somewhere one way or another, okay, so we'll send Gabriel the Malach to push him to the brothers to get that result where he ends up becoming the king. Okay, number one. 
Number two, it's over here, Rabbi Matisiao Solomon says, this is a remarkable thought. Every single person you meet in your life, what does it mean? He meets the man in the sadev. The man finds him wandering in the field. Says Rabbi Matisiao Solomon, every single person you ever meet in your life, it was no accident. Whether good or bad, the guy was placed there for you to meet him. Every single person, when you meet a bus driver, there was no accident. Even if it's only a moment, even if it's only one time that he closed the door on your foot, that was all preordained, predestined. You had to meet that person. For some reason, you had to meet that person in the course of this lifetime. Every single person you meet is going to be, somehow, some way, it's all going to be predestined. And Yosef has got to get to the brothers. That's part of God's plan. And therefore he sends him out, and Yosef is then, Yosef is then met by the Malach Gavriel, and the Malach Gavriel sends him off on his way. What you do is you make the logical decisions. Make the logical decisions, and then realize it's predestined. If you decide, which route should we take? So which route? There's one route that always has traffic, and one route that never has traffic. Which one are you going to take? That doesn't have no traffic. And that day, as you're on that route, a truck happened to break down and block across the entire road. Now there's a 45 minute delay. So people often, oh, hey, we should have gone the other way. Oh, why didn't we go the other way? I don't understand. You had a crossroads and you had to choose a route. Do you have prophecy? I don't have prophecy yet. And, 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 and you had to choose a route, right? So what did you do? What, what are you meant to do? Make the logical decision. I made the logical, so why didn't it work out? Because you don't run the world. That's why it didn't work out. God runs the world. But I made the logical decision. You're right, you made the logical decision. And just because you made a logical, I told you, the Gemara, remember the Gemara we mentioned with Shlomo Amalek and the two men? Do you remember the Gemara we mentioned? Shlomo Amalek met the angel of death. Remember the Gemara, it's a Gemara in Sukkah. Shlomo Amalek met the angel of death. The angel of death looks sad. Shlomo Amalek said, what's wrong? He said, there are two men who I've been sent to terminate their life. And I can't get at them. My job is to terminate them, I can't get at them. So Shlomo Amalek said to the angel, oh, well, that's lucky, and he sends them off. He immediately called in the demons, the Seirim, and he said, transport these two men to the city of Luz. The city of Luz was a city in the ancient world. Nobody ever died in the city of Luz. When they were tired of living, they left the city. And they died outside the city. You were protected from the angel of death. He had no entry into the city of Luz. So the Seirim take the two men, and they start transporting them to the city of Luz. Right at the gates of the city, the angel of death got them before they could get into the city. How do you like that? The next day, Shlomo Malik sees the angel of death. He's all smiles. Oh, you had a good day yesterday? Yep. What happened? He said, exactly where I needed them, you sent them. I was sent to terminate their life at the gates of the city of Luz. You did me a favor. You sent them right there. Thank you. Right? Now let me ask you a question. Did Shlomo Malik do the right thing? Oh, yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. What would you do if you found out the angel of death was after you and you know that there's one city where he has no entry, what would you do? I'd get there as fast as I possibly can. Get to the city of lose as fast as you possibly can. So what happens at the city of lose? You read the data. The data indicates go. You went. God runs the world. That's where you ended up. Your feet carry you to where you're meant to be. You understand? We're not reading signs. You're reading logic. Remember I told you the example. Two guys are at a highway. One guy, uh, a 16-lane highway. One guy closes his eyes, runs across the street, cars are slamming on the brakes left, right, and center. And the guy makes it across the highway safely and finds a wallet with $20,000 in it on the other side of the highway. The second guy looks both ways. He waits for all the traffic to clear, starts heading across the highway, and a light aircraft crashes in and kills him in the middle of the, of the highway. Who did the right thing? The first guy or the second guy? Who did the right thing? The first guy? Who said the first guy? Who said the first guy? Ronnie, first guy, huh? Okay, if you're the third guy, what are you going to do, Ronnie? Read the data. The first guy got $20,000. The second guy got crushed. So what's Ronnie going to do? Ronnie's going to close his eyes and run across the street. I think not, Ron. I, I, I know how much he made. I know how much he made. Right? I know he made as much as I make per hour here. Yeah, I know how much he made. Right? That's not, that what, Ronnie, what would you do? Read the data. He's $20,000 richer, and he's dead. Now, what are you going to do? Well, I guess I'll do what the first guy. No, you're not. You look both ways. Maybe you look up also to make sure there are no aircraft because that's the right thing to do. So why did he have the results? Because we don't, we're not in charge of the results. We don't determine the results. We determine. It's not a sign. Do the logical thing. A sign would be, and this is where the disaster comes in. 
Read the sign. The sign is that close your eyes and you get $20,000. Then you end up like Ronnie. Right? Then he ends up like Ronnie. No, we won't want that. Right? So what? Chas Shalom, right? So what do you what do you get? You get you get you don't read the signs. Read the logic. You read the logic, you do the right thing. What about the results? That a coach broker worries about. It.